thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I gave my first inaugural lecture in this uh, theatre, goodness knows how long ago, and Jim Lovelock was in the audience, so that was, uh, that was great. So what I'm going to do is spend the next 40 minutes talking about energy and climate change, uh, or energy and climate, and I've called it clearing the fog, um, and that's really something that uh, we urgently need to do. Now, I usually start this lecture uh, with this image of the, of the Earth. I, I hope the lighting isn't, um, uh, isn't spoiling your... Opportunity. Can you all see the imagery all right at the back? OK, and you can hear me OK, fine. Well, um, I usually start with this image, which was taken by the Apollo 17 astronauts, so in 1979, a long time ago. And it's a beautiful image because it's one of the few images of the Earth from some distance um, with the sun behind the photographer. And actually, one could spend uh, you know, a long time, 20 minutes, just talking about this wonderful image. Um, but for me, it, uh, the, the key story that it tells, I hope I'm not booming too much now, um, is that you can see if you were an alien and you had uh, just arrived and were having a look at this planet, you would see that it was rather an unusual one, an incredibly complex system and a fascinating one, because it not only has uh, its, its solid and liquid Earth uh, main substance, 99.99% of its mass, um, but it has these fluids, atmosphere and ocean on the surface, so it has liquid water, it has an atmosphere, it has exposed land surface, it has ice, um, all of these things interacting. Um, but across Africa, and I hope you can just about make out Africa there, it's got this green stain which shows that it's got biology. So that sets this object aside from anything else that we know of in the universe. Most scientists believe that if life can happen, it almost certainly has happened somewhere else, but we have no evidence for that as yet. So this object is already uh, singled out by the presence of that green stain, the fact that there's a biosphere interacting with the rest of it. Then, of course, the fact that the photograph exists at all makes it ultra-special because in that biosphere, a species has developed that has, um, has had the wit uh, to put together the technologi technological capability to take the photo. Now, there's a lot more we could say, but I'm, I'm going to move on and interject something now, which has become... Oh, I see why I'm moving. It's this thing. Um, uh, uh, interject a little section now about where we are on climate science and climate change. Uh, none of you will have failed to notice that this subject has been propelled into uh, a very controversial state over the last couple of months. Interestingly and ironically, by all of the media focus and interest in the Copenhagen conference. Now, there are various views of the Copenhagen conference, but most of them agree uh, that it didn't work very well. It certainly didn't work very well by its own uh, aspirations, which were to come up with a legally binding agreement essentially for the, the world collectively to reduce our carbon emissions over the period of the next uh, few decades. Um, and so this uh, uh, little article uh, by Melini Meira says, uh, Copenhagen, the Munich of our times. Um, associated with it, of course, are all of the gates, the Himalaya gate, um, which uh, uh, has, uh, if you like, undermined uh, people's confidence and credibility in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, rightly or wrongly, but nevertheless, that's been the effect, to the point where, amongst the growing list of what you might call climate casualties, uh, Rajendra Pachari, who leads the IPCC, has been uh, damaged, possibly fatally, um, in terms of his career, and we'll see how much longer he lasts. Uh, and then, of course, there's the ongoing saga of University of East Anglia Climate Research Unit and uh, the, uh, at, at best, unwise uh, emails that some of the senior scientists there um, have been demonstrated to have been sending to each other. On the other hand, uh, here's an article that says, yes, but, you know, Climate Gate uh, isn't a very um, pretty sight. But on the other hand, it doesn't change the fact that uh, climate change is real, according to, to Fred Pierce. So what do we make of all of this? Well, interestingly... Um, there are some other factors that are affecting people's uh, view of climate change, whether it's happening or not, and who's to blame. Um, and you can hardly fail to have noticed, particularly if you were on a Eurostar train, um, that we've had quite a lot of unusual snowfall and an unusually cold winter this year in northern Europe and also in North America. And if you look at the results of this uh, uh, populist poll that the BBC were involved in and there are other polls that have been taken in the United States, we see a couple of things. Firstly, the number of people who are confident that climate change is real and is being driven by humans has declined quite dramatically uh, since November of last year or pre-November of last year through to now. 
Um, and of course, the assumption that many people have made is that that's uh, as a result of a mix of loss of trust, loss of faith in the institutions of science uh, through the, uh, the climate gate and the Himalaya gate and uh, whatever other gate uh, controversies that have been picked up by the press, I mean, rightly so. Um, a mixture of that and a mixture of this experience of, of, you know, well, so what happened to global warming then? You know, you hear people say the, clim you know, the planet hasn't warmed since 1998, has it? And, uh, and uh, things have got uh, a bad way this winter. But um, what, of course, your personal experience and what's actually happening on the planet aren't anything like the same thing. And so not many people know that um, January 2010 was the warmest on record globally. So whatever our local experience or regional experience might be, um, the planet is telling us a different story. And, and that's true whoever as uh, climate records you look at more or less. Uh, in some cases, not quite the warmest one, but one of the warmest in the recent years. So um, at the Science Museum, we're really interested in understanding how people make up their minds on complicated, technical, um, tricky subjects like this. Um, and there are, you know, there are, there are so many uh, factors at play here. Um, I, I used to say um, to, the, to the people at the museum, look, you know, it's not, not a question of belief, it's a question of coming to conclusions based on a rational uh, and honest and balanced appraisal of evidence. Um, and they've convinced me, and, and the evidence of what happens when people come to the museum is, is very clear, that by and large, the evidence isn't used in that way. The evidence is used either as a, a linus blanket, a sort of comfort, if you believe that climate change is real, you come to the Science Museum and the Science Museum tells you, yes, you're right, then you say, thank you very much, uh, Science Museum, uh, that you make me feel warm and comfortable and reassured in my beliefs. Um, and if you come in not believing that climate change is real, you get angry often and you start to scratch away at trying to find out flaws in the argument as to why um, you can uh, sustain your beliefs. So, I'm not going to ask you to answer, because I know if I ask for a show of hands, there will be tremendous peer pressure for you to tell me the answer that you think your peers would like to see you give, rather than the truth. So the question is, are you a believer, are you a disbeliever, or are you unsure? And you want to hold those in your minds throughout this lecture. Now, I'm quite upfront about this. I've been involved, you heard that early on in my career, I was involved in space science of one sort or another. Um, and actually, I had a sort of road to Damascus moment in about 1980, where I was working on uh, some satellites to observe solar flares on the sun. Um, and I bumped into somebody who was analyzing data from one of the first serious Earth observation satellites. And I was completely blown away by the data. And I, I thought, you know, that is just as much fun as what I'm doing. It's just as indulgent, and it might be useful too. So I converted to Earth observation. Um, and so I've come to the point where, in answer to the question, what do you believe, what do I believe? Well, I'm a skeptic. And, and one of the problems with the public debate recently has, is that the word skeptic seems to have been um, you know, used to adorn people who don't believe in climate change. But I'm a skeptic. I'm a scientist. I'm a fully paid up skeptic. My career is much easier. Well, I no longer do active science, uh, but when I was a, an active scientist writing papers, it was much easier for me to get my key performance indicators up by attacking things that other people had thought of and showing that they were wrong than coming up with an original idea of my own. Science has all sorts of self-correcting mechanisms in it, and right at the root of it is complete skepticism. You hear somebody come along and say, do you know, I think the continents move, and you all go, bullshit, how could that happen? And then 50 years later, he's proved to be right. So scientists turn out to be um, professional skeptics, and that should always rem be remembered. But on the basis of evidence, I like to think that I have really done as good a rational job as I can in concluding that human-induced climate change is real happening and potentially very serious. But I am not an expert in the whole range of climate science that you have to assemble to come to that conclusion. And so I must rely on my trust in other experts, my colleagues, who I go to, and I do several things when I talk to them. I look them in the eye and see if I think they're telling me the truth. I look at the work they're doing and try and judge whether it's as honest and professional and competent as it can be. And I look at the scientific process that they've gone through. Have they published this stuff? Has it been peer reviewed? And has it been synthesized? Is it broadly accepted by other people in that field? Is there a sense of groupthink there? Not sure about that. But by and large, I try and assess the other experts. And so who do you believe is actually something I've discovered over the last few months applies just as much to me as it does to somebody out on the Clapham omnibus who's trying to make up their mind about this subject. 
So who do you believe is really important? And what, I, of course, I'm asking you to do is believe me. But anyway, we'll, uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll, see, if, we'll see where we get at the, uh, at the end. So why do I believe that? Well, um, I, I had some training from a, a Sun journalist some years ago. And it was, it was, again, one of these uh, uh, sort of revolutionary understandings. If you, if you read an article in The Sun, um, what you'll find is the who, what, why, when, where are all in the first paragraph, and then all that the other paragraphs do is, is add in color. And there are two reasons for this. Firstly, the attention span of a Sun... I'm sorry, I shouldn't say this, should I? <laughs> But the real reason is that um, the sub-editors at 1 o'clock in the morning, when they're trying to release column space to get a new story in, know that they can just lop uh, paragraphs off from the bottom of the story, and the story will survive right to the point they get to the first paragraph. If the first paragraph is there, the story's there. So it seems to me that um, both in the Science Museum, when we tell this story about climate science, and here, we should just get the, the first paragraph in there. So why, why do I believe? Now, I really I do worry a bit about this. I'm sorry, I've chosen it. I wanted to go through the spectrum, and I hope you can read that. But the first thing is that climate has always changed. And, and now, you, this is not controversial. You know, when you, when you read the most, and then I'm trying to find a non-tribal and inflammatory and separatist way of talking about people who don't accept the climate change is real, people who do. So let's just take people who don't accept that climate change is real, driven by humans. They would all agree that the, the evidence is overwhelming that climate has changed all over the place over the long geologic history of the Earth. No problem with that. Um, why? Well, we know that the disposition of the continents makes a big difference, and they've kind of you know, moved around over, over time. If you look at um, uh, the geological evidence for Antarctica, it was a, a, a temperate con continent up until about 30 million years ago, and that's partly as a result of it shifting into its current more southerly position. Um, the Earth's orbit, very subtle changes in the, in the ellipticity of the orbit, the conical tilt of the Earth's um, axis and so on. Uh, has an effect on where the Earth collects its heat and how it's distributed, and therefore what climate follows. The sun, the sun, as we'll see in a minute, is the source of all um, important energy from the climate point of view. The heat that's still leaking out of the Earth is not really important. Um, and of course, the sun is, is not completely stable. We know other stars go all over the place. The sun is quite stable, but it's not perfectly stable. And, and if it changes, the climate system will respond. There's a cosmic ray flux that has an interesting way of interplaying with the climate system, and that varies. When a volcano goes off and dumps large amounts of aerosol in the stratosphere and upper atmosphere, it takes a few years to, for that to rain out. That leads to a, planet, a temporary planetary cooling. Um, and then there's all sorts of... In, this is a hugely complex interconnected system, so there's all sorts of hunting around going on, and the, these are typified by various so-called oscillations, the North Atlantic Oscillation, the El Nino, La Nina stuff, and so on. So actually what that tells us is that this climate system isn't uh, a beast with a huge amount of inertia in it, actually, that you have to do a lot to change. What it tells us is that small nudges can cause it to veer off and do something different. And we do know from the uh, evidence in the, during the last ice age, so only 20,000 years ago, that the climate in the cold state, when you've got an ice age, is capable of flickering quite dramatically, so flickering 10 degree uh, temperatures in Europe, regionally changing by 10 degrees in less than 10 years. So this is a beast that, if you think about that alone, it's probably sensible not to provoke. It's been very stable for the last uh, 10,000 years, unusually so. So second point, there's a temperature difference of 30 degrees between where we are and where the heat that's leaking away from the Earth finally sees, can see through the rest of the atmosphere and radiate itself off into space. And if you do a very simple calculation, which is what physicists are trained to do, um, you can figure out how much heat the Earth intercepts from the sun and what temperature it would have to be at as a black body to radiate that away into space and be in heat balance, given that the clouds reflect away a certain amount of the stuff and the emissivity isn't perfectly one and so on. Um, and you would expect the temperature of the Earth to be minus 15 degrees centigrade. So we wouldn't be here, everything would be frozen over. And if you go and look at the moon, that's about the average uh, surface temperature of the moon, which doesn't have an atmosphere. Actually, if you didn't have any carbon dioxide or water vapor in the atmosphere, um, the oxygen and uh, nitrogen wouldn't give you the uh, greenhouse effect that we have. So the greenhouse effect is a great thing. It keeps us alive. And again, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to say, hmm, 30 degrees, suppose we altered the uh, greenhouse effect by 10%, that'd be three degrees, wouldn't it? 
So greenhouse gases and convection um, are part of the process that causes the atmosphere to be like a resistor in terms of the heat uh, draining away from the surface of the Earth and, and getting away. Now, the next thing which I'll show you is incontrovertible, absolutely no question of it. The hu human beings have, have uh, unbalanced, uh, have, what was the word, word I used, disturbed the balance of the carbon cycle. There's huge exchanges of carbon fluxes between the ocean and the atmosphere and the atmosphere and the land biosphere. These have been you know, following their happy path for um, millions and millions of years. And up until recently, there was a sort of balance. And, and we can look at the carbon dioxide curve and see how it was behaving, quote, naturally, although you know, we're natural too, believe it or not. Um, but since we've been around and since we've been um, playing with uh, uh, fossil-based fuels, um, we've disturbed this balance. And, and just to give you some figures now, we put 27 billion tonnes of CO2 into the atmosphere per year. There's been a 100 part per million increase, which is the same amount as the natural switch between an ice age and an interglacial when the global temperatures of the planet change by about five degrees. Been a 100 part per million increase since 1850. That already is 100 times faster than any of the natural injections of carbon dioxide that the atmosphere has, uh, has uh, received over Geological, recent geological history. And indeed, the last 30 parts per million have been pumped in in the last 17 years. Normally, that, takes, uh, that won't happen on a time scale less than 1,000 years. So humans have shocked the system. Increasing greenhouse gases will increase warming unless somebody can come along with a peer-reviewed, demonstrable reason why not. You know, it's just basic physics. So, you know, you tell me why that wouldn't happen. There is a battleground over how much warming and what the, what the consequences will be, but greenhouse gas increases will lead to increased warming. That's physics. It goes back to 18th, 19th century physics, Fourier, Tyndall, Arrhenius. The modern estimate is that a doubling of carbon dioxide would give you a 2 to 4.5 degree centigrade uh, rise in global mean temperatures ampl amplified towards the poles. A warming will alter atmospheric circulation and climates. The temperature difference between the equator and poles is all part of the driving force that causes the atmospheric circulation and ocean circulation patterns that we see. Um, and so if you change this balance, you will interfere with those patterns. The pattern of evidence reveals that this human component of change is happening. I'll come on to that in a minute. That's another battleground. Um, and then the final thing for me, and the, the thing that is sort of missed when everybody talks about a two degree or four degree warming, I have, very I have a very intelligent business colleague who says, you know, Chris, when I drive down from my country cottage on the Yorkshire Moors down to work, uh, there's a two degree change in the climate between where I am and where I go to work. It doesn't make any difference to me. Why should I care? Well, the answer is we've built the modern world. We spent hundreds or thousands of trillions of dollars building the modern world based on the climate system we've inherited. And you can see what happens to Eurostar, uh, or, or well, it's always the trains, isn't it? But you can see what happens to food supplies when El Nino disrupts the patterns of, uh, of, uh, of climate that we assume in the modern world. Um, and the, my contention is, and there's plenty of evidence for this, that the modern world has been tuned to the climate system in a way that it's brittle. It's brittle to the system that we have. And as urban dwellers, as more than half the planet's people are, um, that's something we should be concerned about, because if the food supplies, and indeed if the energy supplies are interrupted, you or I couldn't survive more than a week. Now look, I'm, I've got to get a move on, so let me take you through my quick tutorial that now paints this in. That's the top line, and the rest of this first part of the lecture simply paints in some of the colour. So these are Paris 2, 3 and 4 of your son, who, what, why, when, where uh, article. So here we are with an image of the system, diagrammatic. The, uh, the sun is pumping energy out in all directions. That's a more or less constant flow. It will vary slightly over periods of time and over the solar cycle. But by and large, uh, not more than about 0.1% variation in this heat flux. The Earth reflects away about 30% of that, as you can see in this image. If it didn't, it would all be black, um, but it isn't. Some of it's blue and white, so that's the stuff that's getting reflected away. That's why you can see it in the image. Um, and that heat gets collected into the, uh, into the fluids and into the biosphere. So the, the, the uh, ocean and atmosphere are symbolized by the blue circle, and the biosphere is symbolized by the green circle. The energy is uh, used, if you like. It's sounding a bit teleological, but you know, I allow myself some oratorial freedom in this. Uh, the energy is, is used to cause the, the fluids to circulate, as I've just been describing. It's also used by the green biosphere to support life. 
Um, you know, every time you go buy a green plant, you know, Prince Charles was right, you know, say thank you very much to it, don't take a chainsaw to it, because all of us rely on basic photosynthesis either on land or in the ocean to keep us alive. The entire food chain um, is supported by that photosynthesis. So that's why the green circle is there, it's really important. Uh, and then when the heat's done its job, or when the energy's done its job, either supporting life or, or causing the ocean and the atmosphere to circulate and warming up the land, um, then ultimately that heat has to radiate itself off into space. And of course, and it does so in more or less in all directions, more or less equally to first order. And the whole point of this is that over the long, long, long four and a half billion year history of the Earth, um, the, uh, the physics of this has caused the red arrows uh, to come into balance more or less perfectly with the yellow arrow to, to, to many, many decimal places. If not, then the Earth warms up until a balance is reached, equilibrium is found, or it cools down. Now, what is happening on the surface is that the, a lot of that energy is getting through to the surface. And so the important story is, ah, well, how does it get back from the surface, that is the ocean and the land, up to being these red arrows? And that's where this 30 degree um, temperature di differential um, is important. Now, um, I said earlier that there is no single scientist who can tell you absolutely everything as an expert about the Earth system. It's just impossible. The Earth system is far too complicated, but science following its reductionist path has separated it out into so many tiny little fragments that you know, individuals are expert on. It's very difficult for any one expert to know about every piece. Probably one of the few people, the best person I've come across who really could stand up and say that he's, he's a reasonable expert on, on, a, on as wide a range of things with as deep a knowledge as you could expect is, is Jim Lovelock, who is quite remarkable in that respect. But anyway, let's do a reductionist thing then. Let's say, well, we've got this complicated object. Let's start to disassemble it so that we can deal with bits and pieces of it. So I've split it up into atmosphere, which is, I hope, self-explanatory, hydrosphere everywhere where the water is liquid, so that's oceans, rivers, lakes, rain, Cryosphere, everywhere it's uh, frozen. Biosphere, all of the living stuff. But I've abstracted humans because we're kind of special case. So you've got humanity. And then all of this sits on the rocky substrate uh, with continents moving around and so on, the geosphere. Now, um, so that's, I mean, you know, take the atmosphere. Um, you, the, the number of specialists who deal with, you know, the troposphere or the stratosphere or the boundary layer or, or the chemistry in the atmosphere or the dynamics of the atmosphere is almost boundless. So you could break up that one piece into a zillion different pieces uh, using a sort of library index system. And they'll all be out there going to their conferences and so on and uh, just generally doing what uh, scientists and academics do. My point is this, that if you want to understand how the whole system works, somehow you've got to put all those pieces back together again. And that's part of what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was about. And you know, it gets a hugely bad press, but it was, a, it was an attempt by scientists Using, giving their time free. How many solicitors would give their time free? You t how many bankers would give their time free? Uh, no way. So the science community has striven to try and reassemble this knowledge in as honest and, and as fair a way as it can. And it wasn't perfect, and I'm terribly sorry, but boy, it was a lot better than most uh, sectors of society could look back and, and, and be proud of achieving. However, even at this level of six pieces, there are six times five over two different ways of connecting them. So there are already 15 <coughs> complex interactions in this complex system. Non-linear, only partially understood and known. You hit one of these pieces, I, you, know, you will not know in detail what the consequences are going to be because things will rattle around that system. It'll ring like a bell. Things will happen in ways that are very, very difficult to predict. So when we get on to models, you know, models are fantastic at giving you insights into how this works. They have a little more difficulty in telling you exactly what it will be like, how it will behave under different forcings over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. However, there are general principles of the behavior of this object which we can deduce. Now, um, it, it doesn't stop there. I haven't drawn the moon. I haven't drawn meteorites hitting it. I haven't drawn gamma ray flashes. What else? I haven't I drawn cosmic ray flux, solar wind. So um, in order to understand this system, essentially all of science, I haven't talked about in humanity the economists, you know, God forbid, the, the cognitive psychologist, sorry, I'm a natural scientist. Uh, but, you know, in, in order to understand how this system works, you better understand all of that. So uh, that's the Earth system, most complex object in the universe. Now, uh, in, at an, in a different audience, some of you may have heard me say this before, somebody stood up in the Q&A and said, well, I don't really accept that. You know, human brain is the most complex object in the universe. We don't really understand what 
uh, you know, understanding is all about. And I said, yes, but my object's got 6.5 billion human brains in it, and they're all messing it up, so I win. Go. And I didn't hear any more about that, actually. Um, it's a challenge to study and understand, and I, won't, I mean, it's, that's a very, very interesting area. I mean, it's huge, it's big, we're tiny compared with it. There are only so many um, scientists out there, there's only so much equipment, you know, how do you deploy it? Are we perfect? You know, it's, it's a big, uh, the, the range of time scales and spatial scales is, is a huge study, and it is so complex. There's no user's manual, and you know, um, none of us would read it, would we, if there were. Somebody said to me the other day, oh, the user, user's manual is just the, man, the manufacturer's opinion of how you should use this object. I'm not talking about Toyota cars. Um, it's finite, that image showed. There it is. There are no spares. There's no little trailer behind there with some extra oxygen or, or oil or whatever it is we might want. And I've alluded to uh, the green biosphere, which I've uh, shown in all its glory in this image. Um, ecosystem services essential to life, fresh food, fresh water, fresh air, fiber, spiritual uplift, you name it. That's delivered by the system, and the economic system pays nothing for that. Bob Costanza and others a few years ago wrote a Nature article where they attempted to assess what the, cost, what the operational cost would be of replacing the land biosphere to keep 6.5 billion people alive. You know, put us all in a space station somewhere. What would it cost to run an industrial plant that would provide us with everything we need? And they came up with a figure of, I think it was $40 trillion a year, something like that, more than the entire GDP of the planet, which the economic system ignores completely and pays nothing for whatsoever. You and I benefit from that completely. So it would be wise to nurture our life support system. I used to run one of the things that didn't appear in my CV, but I uh, spent four years running a, an organization called the International Geosphere Biosphere Program. And they've just come up with this index. They said, you know, how do we get complex information across to people? All the bankers understand the Dow Jones Index. That synthesizes a sort of measure of health of the financial system, you know, Dow Jones or Nikkei or whatever. So this is the equivalent of the Dow Jones for climate change. It takes global average temperature, atmospheric carbon dioxide, sea level rise, Arctic summer sea ice cover, and it puts it into this index. And what you can see from 1980 uh, up until the present, um, it has been uh, constantly rising. And of course, the bottom line is that's not good news. It's a sort of health of, inverse health of the planet index. So what's going on here? Well, if we go back a couple of hundred years to the true organic period of uh, human development, which really um, describes everything up to um, you know, a million years up to uh, a couple of hundred years ago, um, our success, and indeed the success of any organism, is all to do with how we appropriate energy to shape the environment to suit our needs. And the way that we were doing that very effectively was using water, quite a good way of doing it, wind, quite a good way of doing it, beasts of burden, and other human beings used as beasts of burden. So it's no coincidence that slavery was rife until we discovered fossil fuels. Uh, because that's the next bit of the story. We, we discovered these amazing things, uh, coal, oil, and gas, uh, which are you know, compacted energy generated by biological and geological processes over millions of years, stored just below the surface, where it's relatively easy for us to get them, even now, relatively cheap. Um, absolutely amazing substances, and they literally fueled the modern world, combined with the discovery and exploitation of electricity. So science and technology helped a lot, so that we could uh, generate energy and then, and then transmit it uh, to where we wanted it. Now, energy generates, cre uh, creates prosperity. I've got some nice graphs, which I haven't got time to show you. There's just a linear relationship between GDP per capita and energy access per capita in the nations of the world. Poor nations don't have much energy access, rich nations do, by and large. In the UK, it is as if we had, you, me, and I, working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 87 energy slaves delivering the electricity, uh, supporting our food chain, uh, providing us with mobility, and so on. If it was in the United States, it would be 200. If it was in Africa, it would be, I don't know, whatever it is, two. Um, and of course, that creates a tremendous dependency. We know from the tanker driver's strike in uh, September, 2000, um, at September 2000 that the supermarket uh, 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 shelves were empty in eight days. They're actually empty quicker than that, and the government was worried about social instability and food rights and so on. So we're completely dependent on this. So very quickly, this is the carbon cycle. What have we done? We've dug this amazing stuff up to fuel the modern world. We pumped, uh, by burning it, it uh, CO2's gone up into the atmosphere. The ocean and the land biosphere have been very helpful. They pumped half of that down. 
500,000 billion tons were put up there. The energy was very useful, only the fleeting byproduct. The real product is this overhang of carbon dioxide. I say overhang, you know, take a breath. You're breathing air that's got 100 parts per million more carbon dioxide in it, our carbon dioxide, compared with uh, 100 years ago. And here's the impact on the atmosphere. This is the Vostok ice curve showing, car showing carbon dioxide in its natural glacial, interglacial rhythm going between 180 and 280 parts per million. This is where we are now. This is where we're heading unless we intervene. You, again, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to say, you know, this, this climate system, you know, it's, it's varied on quite small, you know, driving forces in the past. We've got this complicated system. We, this is like a hammer blow to the atmosphere. Hasn't had time to ripple through yet. Maybe this isn't wise. Maybe we should think about this. And, and these are the data. These aren't models. These are data. Mention the greenhouse effect, 30 degrees centigrade. We could spend a lot of time talking about that, but uh, maybe in the question and answers. Do we see a pattern of behavior? Well, if I scatter iron filings onto a sheet and you see this pattern, if you saw me scatter the iron filings, then there's no question. I hope everybody here would say, oh, there's a bar magnet underneath the piece of paper, because the pattern reveals the bar magnet. If we zoom in on any iron filing, it may or may not be aligned uh, on the field line. Friction may have held it where it was. The fact that one or two or many iron filings aren't aligned doesn't change the fact that the pattern reveals the bar magnet. So what about climate uh, change? Uh, land surface temperatures over the last 50 years show an overall warming with an amplification towards the poles. Jim Lovelock only uses this graph. He doesn't bother with the rest of it. He says, gosh, if I were measuring the Earth temperature, I would use a global thermometer. What's the best global thermometer? It's the ocean. If you warm it up, it expands. If you put more water in it, it expands as well. That's because you've melted ice. This is what's happening to global uh, sea level uh, uh, as observed by absolutely amazing radar satellites. Um, it's not only rising, but it's accelerating. So sea level rise says that the planet is warming. 90% of the heat imbalance goes into the ocean. If this were because the sun were driving it, then the whole atmosphere would warm. But what this graph shows, I don't have time to explain it, is that the upper atmosphere is cooling. And it's cooling because the atmosphere is a more efficient radiator. And Stefan's law tells you, Stefan Boltzmann law tells you, that if the emissivity has increased, it can radiate away the same amount of energy at a slightly lower temperature, which is what's happening. And then you've got a whole host of evidence about shifting ecosystem seasons and so on, which are all consistent, uh, as is melting ice, um, with uh, the thesis that humans are driving this unusual climate change that we've seen over the last 30 years. Again, this is evidence about warming of the upper layers of the ocean as the heat diffuses in and causes that expansion. So this is why the IPCC, much maligned, came to these conclusions, um, and, uh, and which, of course, are now being questioned. So why won't this change? Here we are. Um, I probably don't have time to spend long on this, but many of you may not have seen things like this is a time-lapse mo movie of a whole year of sea ice cover in the Arctic Ocean. The little hole in the middle is just where the satellite doesn't quite reach. You see Greenland there, uh, Canada and North America, Siberia and so on. And the summary of these data show that over um, the last uh, 30 years or so, um, the summer sea ice extent, the minimum sea ice extent, has declined dramatically and has done so much more than the models implied, to the point where the models are clearly not good. I mean, there's another technical term which I won't use in public. Um, to, but this, but, and, and so I'm with those that uh, are concerned about the models. You know, the models give you fantastic insight, but they don't tell you how the planet is working. Uh, but in this case, it shouldn't give us any uh, solace because they're in the wrong direction. And uh, we see melting of, of uh, sea ice. And uh, I usually, well, if I show this in Cardiff or Edinburgh, I get a round of applause at this point. But, um, you know, is this the future? Yeah. Now, look, I, I'm, I'm noticing that we're at quarter two, and you want me to um, finish in five minutes to give a Q&A, thereabouts. So I'm going to sort of move on through. Um, safe climate change, what is that? Well, a lot of discussion, but maybe two degrees. That's 450 parts per million is where we should stabilize. But actually, what matters is how much more carbon we put into the atmosphere, because it didn't go anywhere other than the bit that goes in the ocean and in the land. The rest of it sits there for a long time. So it, it, you ask people, well, how much more can we burn? And you get various answers. But, and the most optimistic, probably, is about another 500,000 million tons. But remember that figure. That's what we burned to build the modern world. So you can do quite a lot with that, as long as you get down to zero at the end of it. So I saw Copenhagen like this, a bunch of people sitting around a big heap of uh, coal, oil, and gas, 500,000 million tons worth, 
asking themselves the questions, how are we going to do the following? How are we going to improve global equity, which we're all committed to under the Millennium Goals, and quite rightly so, uh, and indeed the world will remain a very unstable place unless we address this, and it'll just get worse as other stresses uh, impinge. Secondly, how do we maintain social stability? How do we stop the supermarket shelves emptying in eight days and us all starving and buying AK-47s and going out and uh, trying to defend our own personal and family's interests? And then how do we inv invest the rest of it to move from a high-carbon world into a low-carbon world? Those are the three things we have to do with that 500 gigatons. So no wonder Co uh, Copenhagen didn't work. You know, who on earth in a few days of mad panic with 30,000 delegates uh, could answer those questions? Well, we know that there's some technologies out there. Um, I used to have a picture of a Prius here, but I decided I'd probably, uh, <laughs> for, the mo for the moment, uh, unless one comes crashing through the auditorium. Actually, I own a toy, so I drive it very carefully. Anyway, um, so, you know, there's technology out there, and uh, both in terms of efficiencies, uh, both in terms of capturing some of the carbon before we release it into the atmosphere, and even possibly uh, extracting carbon from the atmosphere, remediating the atmosphere. And as director of the Science Museum, you know, you come to realize when you look in the archives that on a, on a finite planet with, uh, with many finite things in it, you know, finite uh, resources, one thing that does seem to be unbounded is human ingenuity, and there's a great story there. There's a whole load of social wedges, you know, energy efficiency, food, people, uh, which I don't really have the time to go into. The, economic, uh, the economists uh, tell us, Stern in particular, the cost of inaction exceeds the cost of action. We're not doing very well. We should have been on the green curve to stabilize at 450 in 2000. Blue curve would have taken us to 650. We've actually been on the business as usual curve or worse. So muddling along isn't doing very well. Why is this? It's a very complicated subject. There's a big disconnect between what we do and what the impacts are. There are huge inertias in the system. There's a lot of vested interests out there who are working very hard to prevent anybody taking this seriously. I've mentioned inequity. There's no effective market mechanism, inadequate instruments and institutions. And of course, we're all hugely dependent on this stuff. I don't want to believe this is true. If I woke up tomorrow morning, found out we could go on burning carbon till the cows come home, that would be great, because I benefit from it, you benefit from it, my kids benefit from it, my grandchildren benefit from it. The only thing that would make me happier is if I woke up tomorrow morning and I realized what the problem was, because then I'd be very, very famous indeed. But I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, this is a very tricky business. People say we need leadership. That's what we were looking for at Copenhagen. Maybe we'll get leadership. Maybe we'll get leadership that we're not too keen on. Who knows? If things get nasty, that could be the case. Um, so much more, I'm much more interested in a partnership between people, government, and business. Remember that in the end, uh, whatever we might believe, it's the Coca-Colas and the uh, HSBCs uh, and the Sonys and the Toyotas who will deliver the future. And are planning that future you know, 10 years, 20 years hence, right now. So unless this is a partnership in which we all um, find a way of uh, working together, um, we're not going to get the right answer. And then the last couple of minutes, I just want to talk about communication. If there's one thing that we've seen in the last couple of months is that there has been a really, really serious communication failure. The science community, I can assure you, is not out there conspiring uh, either to um, uh, increase its grant income, or, although I suppose that might be part of the process, but they're not out there lying. God, you couldn't get the science community to agree on anything, let alone a global conspiracy. I mean, goodness me, what are you talking about? So what we're beginning to learn, it goes back right to that business of you know, who do you believe, who do you trust? Because in the end, you've got to make your mind up who you believe. Now, I, I've had, a, had lunch, Norman Tebbit wrote to me um, a, few, a year or so ago and said, I like what you write about population, but I think you're completely up your whatever on climate change. So I said, right, why don't you come and have lunch? And if after lunch you still believe that, um, well, fair enough. So we had a really interesting discussion. Now, imagine talk, Norman Tebbit standing here, and now those of you who are secret uh, non-acceptors can own up in your own heads, and those who accept will take a different view, and listen to Norman Tebbit saying, population must be controlled. Nuclear power is essential. Don't let the UN control the planet. Control immigration. OK, now just think how you're responding to that. You know, are your hackles rising? Are you saying, yeah, he's right, really? I may not admit it in here. And then here's Jim Lovelock. Population must be controlled. Nuclear power is essential. Don't let the UN control the planet and control immigration. Now, both of those have said all those things. 
You know, I guarantee that your reaction to them is completely different depending on who you identify with and who you heard saying those messages. And the trouble is, what we've seen is if you get the wrong people giving the right message to the right people, it completely inflames partisanship, polarization, and a lack of adult discussion, and it completely undermines our capacity to achieve that triangle of collaboration between business, government, and people that we must have if we're to get the answer to this right. Regardless of whether or not climate ch change is totally driven by humans or whatever, we're never going to get to the bottom of this and come up with the right answers if we, get, if we don't get over this, this daily express shrill headline saying it's all nonsense and the Guardian saying, no, it isn't. So people endorse whichever position reinforces their connection to others with whom they share important commitments. And imagine, I followed a car in New Hampshire with the state, uh, the state slogan, live free or die, and it had this bumper sticker, God, guns, and guts made America great. Let's keep all three. How would somebody driving that car respond to this man and this man? You know the answer. And, and if that's the way we're going to engage in this debate, we're never going to get anywhere. So my final point is this. Here are some banks. You and I just spent seven thousand, whatever it is, a trillion, <laughs> I, can't, I can't even count the number of noughts, only bankers, okay, I'm not qualified to count the number of noughts, I'm just a physicist. That's what we spent, you and I and everybody, gosh, you know, that's impressive, isn't it? And uh, here are a bunch of people who's, um, who are going to be inhabiting this planet long before you and I do. How much money are we spending on them? Not that figure. So I'll finish with this, uh, finish with an image. We go back to our first image. There's the planet. You know, we inhabit it. So you, you and I are on there somewhere, um, uh, or at least um, if you're old enough. And then there's this nice little comment. If the Earth were only a few feet in diameter, floating a few feet above a field somewhere, people would come from everywhere to marvel at it. They would declare it as sacred because it was the only one, and they would protect it so that it would not be hurt. So seeing the planet, seeing the planet in front of us and recognizing what it is would change our attitudes. So that's one thing. And then I'll finish with this comment which I think might be slightly scrambled, but Kofi Annan said recently, if the climate system were a bank, governments would have rescued it by now. The question was, should we give up talking about sustainability and talk about self-sufficiency? Um, I, I agree with you. It's really important. You know, asking the right question is really important to coming up with a, a, an appropriate answer. Um, <laughs> Sustainability captures a lot of what we want, and it is much broader, of course, than what we've been talking about here. Um, I, I think the thing, why is it that everybody is so frightened by this, and how is it that it's so difficult for us to know where to go? Why is it, we had a discussion in here a few weeks ago, months ago, with Franny Armstrong, when you know, she was talking about her film, The Age of Stupid, and we asked her, why did you make The Age of Stupid? Why didn't you make The Age of Stupid? titillates and satisfies the believers and simply annoys the unbelievers. You know, so it actually doesn't move us on very much. Great film, fantastic project. We said, why didn't you make The Age of Sensible that showed a, a future that we could all aspire to, a non-hair shirt future, where nine billion people on the planet had achieved a sustainable balance with, uh, uh, with the um, natural systems? And she said, well, the trouble was, Chris, there wasn't one. And, and actually, that's true. If you look at David Mackay's book, if you look at, uh, on uh, sustainable energy without the hot air, if you look at um, Tim Jackson's book on prosperity without growth, there's this assumption that we've got to have growth you know, on a finite planet. How does that work you know, in the end? You know, we're, mm, I'm not sure about that. So it actually causes us to question our, the, the fundamentals of our relationship, modern relationship between human beings and the planet. So it's even more than the question you're asking. And, the, and you could get very depressed at the fact that it's very hard to visualize what that future is. If we can visualize, you know, in any, any organization, and after all, the planet is just an organization, or at least us occupying it, you, know, you need to understand what you're for. You need to have a vision of where you want to be. Once you've figured out where B is, uh, you figure out what A is, and then you're in a position where you can map out a trajectory and get there. And there are various alternative routes, and you can figure out which is the best one. 
one of the problems that we have is that we haven't got a clear picture of what a sustainable world uh, with 9 billion people on in 50 years' time really is. And that's really why the, you know, the universities in particular, engineering, social science, cognitive understanding, all of this stuff, that's why the universities have to be the hotbed of solving that problem. Uh, it, it's not quite the answer you asked for, but it stimulated an important response. There's some other... Yeah, sorry, there's a... Sorry. Yeah. We need to oh. finish now. I'm ever so sorry. Uh, we ran out of time. But uh, there you are. Thanks very much for coming. I appreciate it.